one. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kim Havens. I'm the event manager here at an unlikely bookstore, an unlikely an unlikely story bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. I am so excited to welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalists Jody Cantor and Megan Tuey today to discuss their new book, Chasing the Truth, with fellow journalist Michael Barbaro. Before we get started, I just have a couple technical tips for you. If you have any issues with the video or audio quality, try refreshing your page. If that doesn't work, just try leaving the presentation and log back in using Google Chrome. If you have questions for Jody or Megan, you can enter them in the ask a question box that's right down at the bottom. And you can also upvote questions. If you see a good question there, you can upvote it and the most popular ones float to the top. To purchase a copy of Chasing the Truth, there's a green button right on the bottom. I highly recommend it. I was up so late reading it, could not put it down. Um, it's very good and it'll come with a signed book plate. Jody Cantor and Megan Tui are investigative reporters at the New York Times. Jody has focused on the workplace in her reporting, particularly the treatment of women, covered two presidential campaigns and is the author of The Obamas. Megan has fo focused much of her attention on the treatment of women and children, and in 2014, as a reporter with Reuters News, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Jody and Megan shared numerous honors for breaking the Harvey Weinstein story, including a George Polk Award, and along with their colleagues, the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. They both live in Brooklyn, New York with their families. Adapted from their New York Times bestselling book, she said, Chasing the Truth not only tells the story of the culture shifting Harvey Weinstein investigation, but shares their best reporting practices with readers. Chasing the Truth is the perfect book for aspiring journalists or anyone devoted to uncovering the truth. With attacks on the news media at an all time high, this book shows all the hard work that goes into making sure a story is accurate and balanced before it's published. It is absolutely fascinating, not only filling in the story of their investigation into Harvey Weinstein, but how they approach their sources, how they must meticulously verify leads, and how it takes a team to create a story that can change history. Leading this discussion this evening is Michael Barbaro, host of the hit podcast, The Daily at New York Times, where he provides an irresistible layman's approach to some of the most compelling and complicated stories of our time. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Jody Cantor, Michael Barbaro, and Megan Tui. Welcome. Thank you, Kim. And thank you to Jody and Megan. Um, I really want to welcome everyone to what I think is going to be an exciting conversation about a really exciting book. And I just want to first tell you all about my relationship with these two extraordinary journalists. I have worked with Jody and Megan for many years and in many different modes um, on journalism itself. In the case of Megan, big investigative pieces about Donald Trump and his relationship to women. And Jody, you on so many special episodes of The Daily and you two together on a series of, of pieces that really transformed what, what we could do on the daily in terms of telling people about the investigatory journalism process and making it transparent. And, and really that's what this whole evening is about. You two have undertaken a book, this book that I am really proud to be holding, Chasing the Truth, that I wish I'd had as a student journalist, as a kid growing up writing for the Advent newspaper at Hamden Hall in Hamden, Connecticut. I wish I'd had this book. So I couldn't be more thrilled to, to kind of talk to everyone here tonight about you know kind of what this book is and what it stands for and what you can learn from it um and and in that spirit i want to ask everyone who's logged in tonight if you are a student journalist to just make yourself known you know to say where you're a student journalist uh what your paper is just so jody and megan and i can get a sense of it and and get excited about that fact um and we will watch that on the scroll. And, and to get started, I want to ask you to the question I had when I first got this book in the mail, which is why a book about journalism for young journalists and young student journalists? You know, why this book, especially after she said, which was this extraordinary chronicling of your investigation, why did you decide that, that this was a necessary undertaking and that the world needed it? 
Well, first of all, we just wanted to start by thanking everybody. Um, Kim, thank you for having us, not just to any bookstore, but a really special bookstore devoted uh, particularly to kids. Michael, thank you for doing this with us. You are our friend and our co-conspirator and partner in crime. Um, Michael was part of the original telling of the Harvey Weinstein story after Megan and I hit the publish button at like 2 p.m. Um, on uh, a weekday in October 2017, we like stumbled up to the Daily Studio uh, upstairs to record an episode of the show, which which felt like, you know, sort of part of our initial chance to explain what we had discovered um, to the world. Um, and also thank you everybody for coming tonight, especially at a time when we are all separated and things have been so difficult to be together with you tonight and to like have your company in the pages um, of this book. This is this book is kind of an invitation to join Megan and my partnership. And so to have you with us and to have you experiencing the things that we experienced and seeing the things we saw, it's, it's, it's really, really special to us. Um, so thank you. So to answer your question, there were so many things we felt in, in the wake of breaking the Harvey Weinstein story, the power of Me Too, you know, this the story that had impact beyond what we ever could have uh, believed. But one of the many things we felt was, you know, there is something going on with journalism and young people. There's this thirst, this desire, um, whether it's from student journalists or just kids concerned about the state of the world, to confront authority to understand journalism as a medium, to find out you know, what is happening um, with the truth. And yet journalism can seem so mysterious. You know, it, I think it, it, investigative journalism in particular can be like a magic show where you're not supposed to reveal your tricks. You're mm -hmm. supposed to lay out these secrets in public, but because your sources are often remaining secret, you know, it, there's almost this illusion of like, I got all this information, but I can't tell you where I got a lot of it, which can make it feel very remote. Journalism as a field um, can feel really inaccessible. And we also realized that there's something happening right now with student journalism that is special but hard, which is, you know, the three of us grew up in the days of student papers reporting like, basketball game scores and interviews with new administrators. <laughs> Journalists are certainly still doing that, but they are also grappling with issues that are so much harder. I mean, the really, really weight, weighty stuff in the world, um, complex, serious topics, um, in part because community journalism is faltering in a lot of places and students are stepping into the breach or mm -hmm. just as the stuff that kids are facing at, you know, at the college level and the high school level is extraordinarily uh, complex. And so given that you are tackling those really hard stories, we wanted to give you whatever help we could in, in tackling the really hard stories and teach you some of the tradecraft that we use so that you can do this with some confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, as Jody mentioned, since 2017, since first breaking the story, we have actually traveled around the country and um, actually to foreign countries to talk about this work. We've been on college campuses, we've spoken to high school classes, and we are just so impressed with uh, the young folks out there. I mean, beyond the student journalists, I think that we just kept encountering um, you know, teenagers, young men and women who really want to make a difference in the world. I mean, in, since 2000, it's, it's almost unfathomable to imagine what's happened since we first broke this story. You know, the a contested uh, presidential election, um, the pandemic, uh, the protests in the street. And so there are these massive issues that are taking place in the broader world that are coming into the lives of young people and into their high schools. And we could tell that that these young folks want to make a difference. They want to hold power to account and they have questions, right? Like they've got there's it's clear that so many people out there have a kind of a young investigative mind and curiosity. And so we really want to be able to explain to all young folks who want to make a difference and have this curiosity how to start to turn those questions into findings and discoveries and 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 things that can like 
basically create consensus at a time when there can be so many divisions and truth itself feels like it's collapsing. You know, our investigation was one of those moments in which there was like, nobody was debating what had happened. Everyone was sort of trying to figure out what to do about it. And we want to take readers behind the scenes and show exactly how we did that. Jody, you said something so interesting about how mystical it can seem to get into the world of journalism. And I think investigative journalism, as you implied, is like the next rung of impenetrability. How does one do it? How do you get there? Even within the Times, investigative journalists are in their own special corner of the room. And it almost seems like there's a do not knock on this door sign. I'm joking, but it's like you're all doing something that the rest of us, you know, find a little bit inaccessible. And, and we work there. And, and, so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the on-ramp to that world. And I know in both your cases, it's not the most intuitive thing. I mean, Megan, you were a, an activist in college. Jody, you went to law school for like a hot minute. So like just briefly kind of give us a sense of how it is that you got into this very particular craft. So I inhaled journalism when I was young. I read The Times. This was pre-internet. So and I lived in the suburbs. So when like an interesting periodical uh, arrived at your house, it was like an event, you know? It was like, oh great, this is my lifeline uh, to the outside world. But no part of me, as much as I loved it and inhaled it, there was nothing in me that said I could one day be the person writing and editing the stories. I lived in Staten Island, which is, you know, part of New York City, but can feel very far from it. I did not know a single, uh, author or journalist growing up. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, there were, you know, relatively few prominent women in the field, so it was harder to find people to identify with. And I think that, like, I thought becoming a journalist was like becoming an actor. Mm. You know, that, yeah, you it happens could, to you because of some innate talent. Or that, like it was not ultimately a practical thing to do and that God bless anybody who's willing to do it, but your chance of really getting a toehold is incredibly small, even if you're even if you're really talented. So there were and I think it also provoked like a kind of who do you think you are voice in my head. Like, why do you think that anyone would want to read what you had written or a story that you had edited. So it wasn't until I went to law school and said like, oh, thank you, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. This is not actually mm -hmm. what I wanna do that I had the guts to really try journalism. Yeah, and you're right, Michael, like when I was in high school, when I was in college, I was really, I mean, I did wanna make a difference in the world. and. I thought that activism was the best way to do that. When I was in high school, I was part of a walkout to protest a racist comment by a teacher. Uh, when I was in college, I helped organize a Take Back the Night rally to yeah. uh, try to raise awareness about sexual assault on campus. And it was so exciting to take to the streets and for people to get up and share their experiences and to kind of break the silence. And, um, and but after college, I felt this pull into journalism. And uh, once I started and once I got a taste of what you could actually accomplish in journalism, especially within investigative journalism, I was immediately hooked. And Jody and I talk about this, like there is, mm -hmm. in this world, there is a, you can make a difference in a variety of ways. And, and, and activism is certainly one of those. And in the Me Too movement, you sort of saw journalism and activism playing off each other, but we're not, as journalists, we're not activists. Uh, you know, we, we withhold our opinions and, you know, we stick to facts and we have like a very, very specific process and set of guidelines, ethical guidelines that we follow, that we unpack in this book for you. But as soon as I started to see some of what you could accomplish and the difference you could you could make with journalism, for example, when I was uh, sort of a cub reporter at the Chicago Tribune, you know, I discovered that police and prosecutors were shelving rape kits, DNA evidence connected collected mm -hmm. from the scenes of sex crimes, and that they weren't testing it. There was just like these rape kits were gathering dust in in police storage and. When we wrote, guess what? You know, when we wrote that story and put it on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, all those rape kits came out of evidence, wow. and there was they, the law changed, and you know, it was a matter of which is a level forward. of impact that activists perhaps yeah. cannot match. 
So, you know, to, to go from sort of organizing activism around sexual assault on a college campus to then starting to do it, to, to tackle this issue um, through reporting was, I mean, once I had that experience, I was hooked and it was really, you know, it was, it was, it was some of the experience that I, that I drew on when, when, when we were doing reporting on, um, you know, Donald Trump and his treatment of women. And then certainly, uh, you know, when, when Jody and I were tackling this investigation of this powerful Hollywood producer. It's fascinating how you both kind of channeled these previous senses of yourself into, into this work. I want to turn to the heart of this book, which is how you both took the Harvey Weinstein investigation and you kind of decode it. That's really what this book is. And, and you kind of use it as a framework for understanding what investigative journalism is, how it works. And in the book, there are many obstacles that you two bump into and you you navigate. And I, and I think of them as teachable moments in the book. And it, as I found each one, I, I kind of you know starred them and noted them and thought like, these are fascinating little case studies for how investigative journalism works. And many of them were surprising. And so I want us to take a couple of examples of those. I think it's a really valuable way for us to spend the remaining time here before we go to Q&A and get from each of you a, a moment in this process where you stumbled into something and you were able to crack the case wide open through your own kind of creative journalistic instincts. And, and Jody, I wanna start with you. Um, and we've talked about this, there's a, there's an email you get that could have been the kind of the beginning or the end of the whole thing. <laughs> um, and the way you handle that email. So let's talk about that. So the first person I wanted to talk to about Harvey Weinstein, um, Megan was still on maternity leave. I was all alone. This is the spring of 2017. And Rose McGowan, the actress and actor, activist, has tweeted about a producer everybody thinks is Harvey Weinstein, although she doesn't use his name. And she says that he raped her years ago. And so I, somebody introduced me to her and I wrote her an email asking if she would get on the phone with me. Um, and this is what she wrote back. Let me read you the exact email. She said, Here's the thing. I have been treated quite shabbily by your paper at times, and I believe the root of it is sexism. Hmm. She felt the New York Times discriminated against women, and she listed her criticisms. Uh, a speech she had made at, the, at a political dinner was covered in the style section instead of news pages. An earlier conversation she'd had with a Times reporter about Weinstein had been uncomfortable. And she said, the New York Times needs to look at itself for sexism issues. I'm not that inclined to help. That's about that's about as like loud a shutting door as can be like made by by electronic email. So I had to convince her to speak to me, and I didn't have a lot of leverage because I couldn't say to her, well, we're, you know, really deep into this investigation and it's, you know, it's really compelling and I need to talk to you about it because that wasn't true and we don't lie in the course of our work. Um, if she had asked me how many other sources uh, I had spoken to, the answer would have been none. Right. Um, you know, she was saying she had been a victim of sexual assault. So being too aggressive definitely would have been the wrong stance. Um, I, you know, had experienced, um, I, I thought this could be a meaningful story from the beginning, but you can't promise impact and you definitely can't promise, um, like particular impact. I couldn't say anything like, um, we're going to get Harvey Weinstein because, it, you know, in our work, we're not out to get anybody. Um, the, there's a reason the book is called, you know, Chasing the Truth, because that's our guiding light, right? I mean, that's what mm -hmm. that's what fuels us and that's what protects us in our work, because we're not in a battle with anybody. We, we're just we're just really, really after the truth. And, you know, I also. Um, I, I also couldn't beg because in these interactions, if you become too much of a supplicant, you lose your authority. Mm. So I had to figure out, you know, how to make a reasoned case. 
And what, um, and what I wrote back to her is I, you know, I basically told her that I believed in journalism. I said, look, you know, I do this work for a reason. Um, you know, I've ex experienced enormous impact from stories. Amazon, Starbucks have changed their policies, you know, in the wake of my stories. Um, I mentioned something incredible uh, that had happened, which is I had done a story on nursing moms and readers had created the first freestanding lactation station for mothers. And there are now thousands of them all over the country, you know, and I, and I, but I made the case very respectfully and I wasn't pushy. And then the last line was very significant. I said something like, but if you're not inclined to talk, you know, I, I totally get it. And I kind of said, you know, thank you and have a nice day. And lo and behold, she wrote back and uh, wanted to set up a time to speak. I, I, I want to just focus on one little thing before I ask you, Megan, about a similar teachable moment, which is I'm fascinated by the dynamic in which a source you want to talk to is saying, I object to your institution for any number of reasons, which can happen all the time. I don't like that piece your student newspaper wrote about me last week. I don't like the, you know, the piece that 10 years ago was written about my father by your college newspaper. And the first line of your email back to her from the book, I thought was an incredibly artful uh, redirection, but it was also honest. And, and I'm going to quote from it. This is what you said, Megan. You said, here's my own track record on these issues. Yeah. And it was, it's, it's so interesting that you did that because you didn't try to defend the times. You're, you're, that's a losing battle if someone doesn't like the times. You just said, here's what I do. Here's what I stand for. Here's what I'm going to be to you as a journalist. And and I and she found that very compelling and that seemed to begin to crack the whole thing wide open. So I think that's a fascinating example of how much thought you need to put into an email. I mean, if you had just decided to fire off a quick response to Rose McGowan saying like, sorry, you don't like the times. I'm not the time. It just like, they could have completely altered the course of the investigation. So. I mean, God, teachable moment, like spend an hour or two really thinking about what you want to convey to someone who's vulnerable and needs to hear something very particular from you. It's really fascinating. Um, Megan, you have incredible teachable moments around showing up, physically showing up to places where God knows, I don't think anybody probably thought they wanted you to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that being really important to understanding how the story uh, breaks wide open. So can you tell us a story about that? Sure. You know, so Jody started the Weinstein investigation while I was home on maternity leave. And so when I came back to the newsroom and I decided to join her on the story, on a, on the reporting, um, one of the first things I did was set about trying to find this woman who had worked for Harvey Weinstein many years ago in the early 90s. And she had disappeared from the company and there were there were rumors that something bad had happened, that he had perhaps sexually assaulted her. And so like every reporter, the first thing you do is try to gather any contact information on a person of interest and start putting those phone numbers to use, those email addresses to use. And so I was repeatedly calling this woman's, I, we had figured out where she worked and um, we didn't have a home phone number, but we knew where she worked um, through some online sleuthing. And mm -hmm. I was reaching out to her at her, this place of work, but I kept getting the front receptionist. And it was really tricky because I kept saying, I'm a reporter from the New York Times, I'd really like to talk to her. But of course I couldn't explain to this receptionist why. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'd be revealing potentially confidential and painful information. So I kept leaving messages. I kept trying to send emails. They were, they, you know, they, I, I, I was getting nothing back. And so it's one of those moments where you kind of pause and think, okay, time to give up. Just scratch this off the list. You're not going to get anywhere with this, per this person's interest. But what, I decided to do was there was this woman had a relative who lived in a suburb of New York and I had her address. And so I decided that I was going to drive out there uh, one yeah. summer afternoon with a handwritten note um, explaining who Jody and I were um, and why we were the investigation that we were working on. And my plan in my head was okay, I'll hand this to this woman, the, this relative of the person of interest, and hopefully she'll pass it along. So she'll get something handwritten in her hands that she can, will give her a sense of who we are and I won't be violating 
her privacy with her employer in any way. But I got to say, you know, as long I've been in the business for now 20 years and there, it doesn't doing a knock on a door like this never gets any easier. You know, I sat mm -hmm. in my car, you know, I put a little lipstick on, um, I changed it out of my flip flops into some sandals and I psyched myself. I had to psych myself up. I had to say, get out of the car, knock on the door when everything, <laughs> every single part of your body is saying like, no, actually, why don't you just drive? I think there's a diner around the corner. Let's just, you know, like, forget this, forget this. This is going to be too uncomfortable. But I forced myself out of the car. I knocked on this door, this big wooden door. And the person who answered was the person of interest herself, this woman she wow. was visiting the relative. And she said, oh my, and I introduced myself, you know, I put my handwritten note in my bag and I just said, mm -hmm. you know, I'm Megan Tui. I've been trying to get in touch with you. And she said, oh my goodness, I can't believe you found me. Um, and then she said, I've actually been waiting for this knock on my door for 25 years. And so we, you know, she came out onto the front steps and we talked and um, it was a real, teachable moment for me in the investigation, because first of all, to, to have somebody say, I've been waiting this, for this knock on my door for 25 years was just like another affirmation of there is a story here. <laughs> um, and also that it's- Nobody else had knocked on their door. Nobody else had knocked on the door. Nobody else had knocked on the door. And that, you know, from as a cub reporter being sent out to cover a shooting or the county fair or anything, you know, you have to, up through an investigation like this, it's still some of the like basic like journalism 101, like knock on the door, go up to the person on the street and 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 just psych yourself up, even when you know so much of you wants to turn away and not have to deal with the awkwardness of that. And I think another key lesson here is in our highly digitized world, you want to send a DM, you want to send an email. And that's okay. That's a really nice starting point. I know that's what we did with many of the women we talked to about Trump. But there really is no substitute for two human beings sitting down over over a cup of whatever um, and having a human interaction and, and being empathetic and real. And that's a fascinating example of that. You also could have come up completely empty handed. So totally. um, Jody, I want to turn in our, I think, final teachable moment to the importance of documentation. What mm -hmm. you all showed when it came to the Harvey Weinstein story and your book is called She Said many investigations can end up in moments of so-called he said, she said, because there may not be documentation, irrefutable physical evidence that something happened. And what your investigation had in spades was documentation. Can you just tell us a story of how you got these highly sensitive documents, maybe just one, and why it was so important? Sure. So you're totally right about the importance of documentation, especially because women were so scared to speak out. Um, it's, we talked to so many women, uh, during the initial investigation who had Weinstein stories, but really felt that they couldn't speak about them. Um, and so what we did is we tried to amass as many varieties of evidence as possible. And it turns out there was an extraordinary amount of evidence in part because this stuff occurred in the workplace, right? There are other Me Too stories about, for example, rapes that take place in social situations. Those um, can be harder to write about sometimes because often there's less stuff left behind. We're talking about Weinstein, a producer who headed two companies, and the kind of essence of his predation was that he took advantage of his work status and his status as a producer to pressure these women. Some of these are sexual assault allegations. Some of these are rape convict allegations. He was convicted uh, for sex crimes um, in New York in 2020. But, but the essence of them is that he's, he's essentially using his big shot quality to manipulate them. Um, and to exploit them and take advantage of them. And so that left behind a lot of stuff, right? Because there were there were the settlements, the money he had paid out to these women with all of these lawyers involved and there were you know, sort of secret uh, records of those. And then there were also, um, there were HR documents, there were mm -hmm. company documents. Um, and we, we began to get a sense that they might exist um, through a figure named Erwin Ryder. 
And Erwin Ryder was kind of the deep throat of the Harvey Weinstein investigation because he was like the precious special secret source who was feeding us information from the inside. I contacted him in September of 2017, just weeks before we broke the story. I never thought he would speak to me because he had been Harvey Weinstein's accountant for 30 wow. years and he was still working for Weinstein. Wow. So there was this period when he was like going to the Weinstein company every day. And then he was meeting me at night um, in this bar in downtown Manhattan. And the way he initially spoke was kind of like jumbled and confusing to follow. Um, but but we started, you know, he would sort of say these cryptic things um, at night and then Megan and I would try to decipher them during the day. And it turns out that he had documents and they were sitting right there on his cell phone um, in many cases, he had documents that really uh, provided significant proof uh, that not only that Weinstein had victimized women, not only that he had victimized women in a pattern that was consistent with the stories we had going back to the 90s, but that he had done this pretty recently. You know, we were sit I was sitting there with Irwin in 2017, and some of the stories we were hearing from like 2015, like it, it was extremely current. Um, so there, there was one story he was reluctant to discuss at first. He told me a little more and he told me a little more and he made reference to a memo, but I didn't really know whether the memo was significant or not. And by the way, that is often the way it happens. Um, even sources, because they're not journalists, they don't always know what information they have is mm. really relevant and which is really extraneous. So Erwin would tell me about like a million different things and it took some sorting to really figure out what to focus on. But it turns out that the most valuable document he had of all was this memo that a young producer named Lauren O'Connor had written about the atmosphere at the Weinstein Company. And she had suffered verbal harassment from Weinstein, but she was mostly writing as a witness. She was, she was kind of documenting the overall atmosphere at the company towards women and, and writing about like a kind of accumulation of evidence and incidents she had seen. And it turns out that she put this all down in a memo. Um, and, you know, I once, I really, really, really wanted to see it. And it was really scary for Erwin to give it to me for a variety of reasons. But one night I just kept asking him about it and asking him about it. And, you know, sometimes when somebody won't give you a document, they'll at least read you bits of it and you can, you know, you can scribble it down on your notepad. So that's what I was hoping to do. I was trying to get, I was trying to get him to kind of read it so I could figure out what the best lines were so I could write them down. And so he started to do that a little bit. And then he just looked at me and he took his phone and he put it on his chair, open to the memo. And he said, I'm going to the little boy's room. And it was like, he was saying, do with this what you want. So I got, you know, when like you're nervous that your phone is gonna malfunction and that you're like the important thing you have in front of you is gonna disappear. I took his phone and, you know, by the way, you can't forward an email like that because that would obviously lead, leave a trail. Mm. So I took the memo and without even like having time to read it, I screenshotted it um, and on my own phone, um, and then the phone was waiting back on the chair when he got back from the bathroom and we like went through the pretense of, you know, finishing our drinks and paying the bill. And then I went to the ladies room and I sent Me I sent Megan and our editor, Rebecca Corbett, the memo before I even read it. Cause I also had that feeling of like, well, I cannot have the sole copy of this. I need yes. to get this, you know, to my partner immediately. So it turns out they were still up. It was like 1130 at night. And, and I think we all read that memo simultaneously. And it was an aha moment because what Lauren O'Connor was writing about and her, she had been silenced. Her memo had been like essentially wiped um, from history. It was like, you know, the key turning in the lock of our reporting because this woman we had never met was, it was like she could have been describing what was in our notebooks. It was such a match and it was this written confirmation. And and when the bosses figured out the next morning what we had, that's when they were like, right, like this cannot hold, like you need to get this into the paper. I remember when the first 
Harvey Weinstein story ran, how powerful that memo was as a piece of evidence of, of what the this, this series of stories ultimately established. There's an interesting question I think I had at the same time uh, in the notes here, which is, so wait a minute, did you take a photo of the phone from your phone or do you not want to get into tradecraft here, Jody? But like, yes, how did you take the photo? It was like, I put his phone here and then I held my phone on top Got of it. it and I screenshotted each mm -hmm. page of the demo. You That's know, I, I, I want to, I feel like this would actually be a good opportunity to ask you a question, Michael, because, okay. you know, over the five years, past five years of hosting The Daily, you have become one of the most famous interviewers mm -hmm. um, and in the business. And, you know, you've done so many interviews and I'm just curious to know if you have a teachable moment when it comes to conducting interviews, if there's any particular moment that stood yeah. out for you over those. Yeah, it, well, it, it strikes me as very much in line with what we're talking about here and something you guys put at the end of your book about, about going into interviews with an open mind. I mean, I, I think that everyone's greatest fear when they meet a journalist, well, there are many fears you have when you meet a journalist, but I think that the one that comes to mind is that this person's already made up his or her mind about me and I'm just there to get fitted into their story. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm not sure that's an entirely unfair criticism. That does happen sometimes. And it's bad when it does. And we set out on the daily early on to interview a, a gun store owner who had sold a gun used in a mass shooting, in the Virginia Tech shooting. And it was an incredibly delicate interview. And we wanted to understand the simplest of questions. What is it like? when you own a gun store and you believe in the second amendment and one of the guns you use, you sold gets used for the most horrible thing imaginable, the, 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 the death of young people. And we found this gun store owner and we started interviewing him and every way we decided to structure the interview was around, was around non-judgmentalness. You know, just how do we make a person feel like we're genuinely curious about who they are because we are. And, then, and also so the listener understands this as a real person. And I remember the epiphany we had when we structured the whole interview was, if we start this interview by asking this person the kind of the 11 o'clock TV news question, which is, what was it like when you sold that gun used in a mass shooting that we were off on all the, all the wrong feet in the interview? And the first question we asked was, tell me about your gun store. Just be a person, tell me about your yeah. life. And the interview unfurled from there and it wasn't until halfway through the interview that we asked about that day, by which yeah. point he understood that we were genuinely interested in who he was. And I think the response we got to that interview was really powerful. People didn't ever expect they'd wanna hear from a gun store owner. And what they heard was a man who was tortured by the experience, whose daughter went to Virginia Tech and who himself struggled with what it even meant to shoot a deer and who was much more layered and complicated uh, than you ever expected a person to be in that situation. So uh, when I think about interviews like that, I, you know, I, I think about th this, one of the pieces of advice at the end of your book, Megan and Jody, which is about, you know, and, and something Dean Beck, our executive editor says, which is, you know, you go into everything with an empty notebook. You, you can't, you can't have an agenda. It sounds so simple, but it's actually hard. It's real work to be open-minded well, and empathetic. Well, and also you make such a good point, Michael, which I think is, you know, equally important as going in with an empty notebook and an open mind is remembering that everybody on the other end of the interview is a human being. And, you know, for this, in our initial investigation and then reporting for our book, we actually ended up talking not just to Weinstein, not just interviewing Weinstein, mm -hmm. but we ended up interviewing, um, you know, the lawyers who worked for him, uh, ultimately, like one of the private investigators who had helped try to dig up dirt on the women that he thought might come forward. Um, eventually his own brother, Bob Weinstein, spoke extensively with us. Um, and I think, you know, these were all people who in many ways had no incentive to talk to us because they were seen as being complicit in what happened. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, rightfully so, so, they were complicit. But, you know, I think one of the reasons we were able to get so many of these um, enablers, if you will, to talk to us is that we went into we went into those interviews and we approached them in much the same manner. Is that like this is a human being who has, you know, their own personal right. stories and their own sort of perspectives and how they came came into this to the to this story onto the stage and and you know I just think that that's a that 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 and remembering that everybody's a human being is not just like the right thing to do as a human being, but it's also an effective way to do, conduct interviews. Right. Even when the president himself 
president-elect almost calls you and screams at you, he's a human being. So make sure you yeah. get to that part of the book. We've, well, we've been, on the, we've been on the phone together, interviewing yeah. Trump together and being screamed at together. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, talk, let's look at the questions that are in this chat because they're fascinating. And I, I leave it to you to, to decide uh, which of you to answer each. This might be a good question for Jody because it mentions Rose McGowan. Um, this question is from Katie Weissman. What happens to a story like the story you two worked on when the victims don't speak to you? What would have happened if Rose McGowan hadn't spoken to you? The story still matters, but how do you go about doing it while respecting, and I'm assuming what you mean is like basically respecting the privacy of those involved. If people don't talk to you, do you have a story like this? Um, like so there, there were many victims who did not want to speak with us. There were enough who did that we could kind of get a toehold. One thing to remember um, about journalism generally, and especially investigative journalism, and think about this when you read the paper, is that there are kind of two layers. There's what you learn, and there's what you can put in the paper. And those are two different things. And the hardest stories are often about figuring out the truth first before you even get to the layer of what you can publish. So I think part of the reason why the Weinstein investigation had momentum from the beginning um, was that there were three prominent actresses who, like basically in the first six weeks of reporting, even before Megan got back to work, decided to tell me the truth. One was Rose McGowan, the second was Ashley Judd, and the third was Gwyneth Paltrow. And it was like, boom, 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 because the Rose McGowan story was very arresting. The Ashley Judd story was like, wait a second, this is pretty similar to Rose McGowan's story and they don't even know each other. Um, and then the Gwyneth Paltrow story had some resemblance to those first two stories. It was also a hotel room story. It actually took place at the same hotel in Beverly Hills that Ashley Judd's story took place in, which is like pretty telling. Um, and not only that, but you know, Gwyneth Paltrow was Harvey Weinstein's biggest star at the time. She was like the golden girl. People uh -huh. used to call her the first lady of Miramax. And it was like, if Gwyneth Paltrow has a story, who else has one? But there was a catch with all three of those interviews. They were off the record. So right. essentially the bargain we were making with these women and that they were making with us is we said to them, we really just like, we really need to know the truth. And they said to us, okay, we'll be completely honest with you. We'll be completely frank, but you can't put it in the paper. So you go from the first anxiety, which is what the hell happened here? And are we ever gonna be able to get any of these people to talk to us to the second anxiety, which is the anxiety the anxiety of knowing and feeling like, okay, like now I'm carrying around this grave secret, but I don't, you know, like, during the investigation, probably Megan and my greatest fear was the fear of failure and the fear of carrying the stuff around for the rest of our lives, right. knowing that we had failed to bring it um, to bring it publicly to light. So, just to finish the answer to the question, you know, so much of the investigation was about like that painstaking journey from here's what we know to here's what we can put in the paper, but there were still. Um, there were still many, many women who would not speak to us. Women who came out about Weinstein, later Angelina Jolie, uh, other famous actresses who like did not answer our emails or phone calls during the course of the investigation. And then there's one um, Weinstein victim named Rowena Chu, who you will meet in the book. I had, that was also like a dramatic story of showing up at somebody's house um, and, uh, and things kind of taking a turn. Um, Rowena did not speak to me then. She did not speak to me after we broke the Weinstein story. Um, it was only when we were working on She Said, which is the you know earlier iteration of this book, that, that she spoke with us. And she finally went on the record with us in May of 2019. So that just shows sometimes it takes two years to get someone to talk to you. Right. Megan, there's two questions along similar lines here, which is when do you know you're done digging and when do you know you're you're possibly ready to start writing, which feels a little bit related to what Jody was saying. And I, I wonder how you start to get to that place in mm -hmm. your head. Well, I can tell you, I mean, there's two, the, the sort of first two phases of uh, an investigative project are like, one, is there a there there, right? So Jody's saying that 
early on, you know, there had been all these rumors about Harvey Weinstein. There had been some news organizations and reporters who had tried to report on this and had, you know, had failed. Like they just, they, you know, and those were for a variety of reasons, but, you know, we couldn't tell, you couldn't tell, like, if you got a tip, it's just a tip. If a rumor is just a rumor. And so with Jody's early reporting, she was able to see that there was, she was able to see enough to know that there was a there there, right? Three different actresses telling very similar stories about the same producer, not willing to go on the record, right? So then there's the difference between is there a there there? Do we have a clear path to like basically convince ourselves that it's the right thing to spend time and resources mm -hmm. on this? Jody and I spent months on this investigation. You know, there were trips to California, and the UK and, um, you know, meetings with sources. And it, it's, it's, it's an investment and an investigation is an investment. And so early on, the question is like, is this worth an investment? And I think early on, pretty early on, there was enough reporting to show that the answer was the yes. And then the question is, and so then there's this really, as Jody described, this fear of failure, where you know that you're basically seeing wrongdoing and you're getting, you're starting to get piece together the puzzle, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to publish it because you're going to have to get people on the record. You're going to have to get documentation. So there was this one moment months into the investigation where we went out for a drink with our editor, Rebecca Corbett, and we spelled out like everything that we had discovered that there were multiple actresses who had been with allegations of sexual harassment and sexual assault, women in his own, who had worked for him in his companies, um, what we believed were secret settlements that had been paid to silence them. And she was like, how, you know, how many people are on the record? And that point, the answer was zero. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what doc, how much documentation do you have of these secret settlements? And at that point, the answer was zero. And she said, well, you don't have a publishable story. So, you know, that was months into our reporting. And so, once we were able to get, you know, it wasn't until we were able to finally get, there were two women, only two women on the record in that first story. And we were able to basically confirm this trail of, of financial payoffs, the secret settlements that we knew that we had a publishable story. And, you know, we'll also be honest, as everybody knows, Ronan Farrow was also working on an investigation yeah. of Harvey Weinstein first at NBC. And then at the New Yorker, and so when we realized that he, when we heard from sources too, that he, that he was uh, getting close to the finish line, then there was a real incentive to make sure that we published sooner rather than later. So, you know, if Jody and I had our way, we would have continued on reporting more and getting additional people on the record. But at that point, you know, it was really important for us to, to break this. We wanted to be the ones to break the story. Right, and you and you did, and you did it responsibly, right? I, I'm, I'm sure right. in the back of your heads was also the idea that if you if you weren't ready, there was no way. Oh, you're right, ready. exactly. Like if we'd found out that you know if if we'd found out that Ronan Farrow was close to the finish line, you know, the morning after our drink with our editor, when she said you don't have a publishable story, it wouldn't have changed the fact that we didn't have a publishable story. We wouldn't have put in something that wasn't publishable. We probably just would have taken more time without that. Mm -hmm. The the question here is, which is fascinating, and, and I and I genuinely don't know the answer. When you guys talk about investment, how hard is it to convince an organization like the Times, and perhaps an organization not like the Times? Um, I don't know how much I can speak to that. To let investigative journalists make an investment like this, because you it's know, so meaningful. It, it's such a good question for student journalists yeah. because at the Times it's easy. At the Times, like, like. It, we were coming off the Bill O'Reilly investigation that the Times had done, which was such a powerful signal to investigate sexual harassment. We had the support of our editors from the beginning. And because those actresses, the actresses, those first three actresses didn't know it, but part of what they were doing um, was really giving us our material to show our editors the potential strength of the story. Like they, like we couldn't tell them this, but you know, of course, we were like telling the bosses what we were, what we were hearing. But I think as a student journalist, it, that's a really, really, really hard question because sometimes you're reporting on your own institution. And so the question of, you know, how much independence do you have? How much institutional um, support do you have? Come, it uh, really comes into play. And then you have everything else that, you know, is going on in your life and you're not being paid for your work. And I think that what your lodestar, you know, there's a real art to picking stories that are 
hard enough so that they're revelatory when they're published, not so hard that they are impossible and stories where, where like you have a reporting path. And I would say first and foremost, make the case to yourself, you know, for, and, and make it to your peers, you know, explain why this is important. And then also see like, like a word that our re editor Rebecca uses a lot is gettable. You know, she'll, she'll say all the time to Megan or I, like, well, what do you think is gettable? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes she's asking it literally, which is like, you know, like what information do you think you can obtain on such and such a story? But sometimes she's asking it more broadly, like, okay, you guys now have this radar for information, you know, at the point, at this point in your career is like what, like using your sort of depth perception, like what, like, what do you think is achievable here? And, and I think that's, that's really important to think about and you want to have a game plan. Um, you want to have a game plan that, that, that helps you calculate, helps you calculate what is gettable. But the other thing you have to ask about, Dean Bacay, our boss once gave me this advice and he said like, Jody, you, you never know what you're gonna get in the course of reporting. The only thing you can ask yourself is, is this a question worth asking? Mm -hmm. Is it safe to say, because I think it's important to set expectations for how much work and investigation like this is, no matter where you're doing it, this is not nine to five work. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly, you know, Jody and I, we live 10 blocks apart in Brooklyn and um, we're doing this reporting as we were also kind of juggling parenting young children. You know, as I mentioned, I came back, I started on the Weinstein investigation mm -hmm. with like a four month old daughter at home. And so, you know, we like, of course, for the most part, we were, go you know, showing up in the newsroom, riding the subway with our backpacks on into the newsroom and working from nine to five in the newsroom. And then at home, uh, you know, doing interviews late at night. I mean, listen, if, if, you, if there's if there's a, if there's somebody that you're dying to talk to for an investigation and they're not available nine to five, you don't say, well, there you go. You know, you say like, well, I'll talk to you at three o'clock in the right. morning if you're in another country. I'll talk, you know, when, like you tell me uh, when when's a good time to talk. And so, you know, in terms of working on weekends, and I think that the, the, the thing is about reporting and especially investigative reporting, and you know, that just, and just that general kind of curiosity is that once you start to get crumbs, um, you know, you just want to, you want more and more and more. And so I think that it's also really important for all the young journalists to like be really honest with themselves about what is it that you are genuinely curious about. I don't, not the person sitting next to you, not even necessarily your editor. What is it that mm -hmm. you are interested in? What is it that's going to like basically make you get out of get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning right. to do an interview with a source? And you know, once you're able to kind of mesh your interests and your curiosity with a like the right subject, you know, you're off to the races. There's a question here about corroboration and re-traumatization. And it reminds me that you had to talk to, I believe, Ashley Judd's mother, one of you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. cor corroboration means asking someone who's been through something awful sometimes to put you in touch with the person they may have first told. And it's complicated. It may be an issue of, of kind of shame and personal sensitivity. So how do you navigate that and how are you sensitive to the kind of growing understanding that making people tell a story like that over and over again is actually pretty taxing. So I think what you're trying to convey is that you're doing it for everybody's protection. You try to be really professional about it. In this kind of reporting, you are not the women's shrinks. You're not their friends. Um, you're not, you, you want to do a good job psychologically, but you're not there expressly for psychological support. And, and we actually find that the more explicit you make that, the more comforting it is because I think women who, I think telling this, this kind of story to a reporter is sort of like going to a surgeon for an operation. You want to know that you are in really professional experienced um, hands. And so, and even though we were immensely moved by the stories we were hearing, you know, we, we would hold it together. We wouldn't become overly emotional in interviews in part because you, you, 
you know, I don't think that's a good feeling, you know, for um, for a victim of trauma who's who's telling telling their story. They want like a very calm um, listener. So so basically, the case you make is, I'm going to ask you a million questions about this. I'm going to try to do it in a sensitive way. You can stop me, you know, if I make the wrong move. Um, but there's a reason I'm doing this, which is this is really for everybody's protection. First and foremost, for your protection, we, you know, cannot put a half-baked story out there. Like, we need to understand this really, really deeply. Um, you know, my editors are going to ask me a ton of questions. The, the fine details, you know, often really um, matter. Another big thing to convince women of is that you know, there's almost like no perfect rape story or perfect assault story. There's always, you know, some like, well, I willingly went to the hotel room or I smiled at him or I sent him a really suck up -y email afterwards that I'm embarrassed about. And you want to say to the women, like, I want to hear all of that. Bring it on. I need to understand it fully because we need to acknowledge that in the story, lest he be able to come after you. If you acknowledge it up front, it's not, it's not gonna be a problem. Um, and then if somebody, you know, if there are inconsistencies in somebody's story, or if there is some uncertainty, um, you do need, I think, to, to really press on that. The, um, what you, I think that many people appreciate that because they want to be part of a story that's professional and well done and doesn't have mistakes or weird loose ends. And the truth is it's for every party's protection. It's certainly for the victim's protection, but it's for our protection as journalists. It's for the protection of the New York Times. And it is for the protection of the accused. You know, it is not fair to Harvey Weinstein or any other man right who bring, these are very serious charges. You can't put them in the paper with, without having gone the last mile. So there's a funny story when we were at Gwyneth Paltrow's house um, in the Hamptons that first summer. And, you know, she's telling, she had already told me her story on the phone. She, Megan comes, she, Megan's hearing the story kind of live for the first time. And, you know, it turns out that her sort of corroborating person is Brad Pitt. And, Megan, like totally straight face, you know, looks at her and says, we're going to have to call Brad Pitt and hear this story from him. And, you know, she was like, OK. Yeah. Well, I was going to say I was just going to follow up on it because it is such an important point, like in the same way that you really need to um, treat everybody like a human being in an interview, even the, the bad guys. Um, I think you also need to be uh, scrutinizing of what everybody's telling you, even, you know, victims. And I, when I worked at the, you know, I worked for a period of time at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and an editor of mine had like a little saying over his desk, which is, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. Mm -hmm. And um, which is sort of funny, but in this business means like that even for, you know, that you can't, you can't drop the scrutiny ever. Like you have to, it's just a fundamental part of what we do. And one of the things that we unpack in this book and it always makes me think, Michael, you may remember this, but when we were doing reporting on Trump's treatment of women, and, and we, we've mentioned this in the book, but you know, there was a woman who had um, been in Trump's orbit and had worked for him at one point and had been actually at staying at Mar-a-Lago uh, many, many years ago and where she was having to sort of help host and be somewhat sort of performative for the parties that he was hosting. And she told us a story, like a, a really upsetting story about him uh, groping her at one of those parties and her running off to her room and shutting the door. And she was from a different country. And she said, I called my father and he told me to stay quiet. And, um, you know, because Trump came up and was banging on my door. And, um, and we were like, oh my goodness, this is like, this is, you know, we got to, this is going to be the lead of our story. This is such an upsetting account. And we were like, okay, well, we gotta, how are we gonna corroborate this? How are we gonna sort of check this allegation out? And we were trying desperately to get in touch with her father and we couldn't do it. And eventually one of our foreign correspondents in the country where he lived tracked him down and went to his home. And the father didn't have a recollection of that. He said, I, I don't remember that happening. Now it doesn't mean it didn't happening, but it was enough where we said, okay, we can't put that in, we can't put that in the story. Right, we're, we're rounding, out towards the end of our conversation, I can tell our host is back. I'm um, back. 
I could just go on. I could go on and on. We could go on forever. Yes. Well, actually, a lot of the people in the audience have set up a Twitter group chat. <laughs> so you guys can continue. <laughs> I love it. Maya, thank you for taking that on. Um, I think if you want to add, um, jump on that. It would be fantastic. There are so many stories. You guys are just amazing. And I was dying. I'm like, so I'm going to have to call Brad Pitt. <laughs> that, is, that is just great. I highly recommend all of these stories and more are in their book, Chasing the Truth. You guys absolutely should buy it. Just click the green button down below. You will get a signed book plate from Megan and Jody. And Michael, thank you so much. I mean, you're just, I, I'm just very grateful to you, honored to have the three of you on I telling the story. And I think this is your first event for the book. I looked for, I always try to scope out other events and I'm like, I don't think there are any. So we're very honored to have you. We'll welcome you back in the store whenever we're all in person again. And Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. All Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks everybody for coming. Everybody. Yes. I'm going to go jump on the group Twitter chat and see what all these journalism <laughs> students are done to talk about. Awesome. Thank you.